Hey everyone. So today I figured we could come back to Europe and have a look at a European country. And in fact, I've been wanting to make a video about this region for a while, so whenever I would pass by one of these book boxes, I would check for any um, travel guides for that country, for the Czech Republic. And as you can see, I might have been a little too enthusiastic with everything that I've picked up. But I think it gives us a great overview over some uh, different approaches to trail guides through the decades. We're going to start out just with an overview of the Czech Republic and then have a look at Prague with this newer city guide. There's another one of Prague here that I got recently. Then there are these two older ones. I already have the Czech Republic on. We already have some Czechoslovakia here. And then in the end, we're going to have a quick look at this beautiful travel guide from the 50s, which I think is really special. But for now, let's put these aside. In fact, I think we're gonna put the Czechoslovakia one aside altogether. We have enough to look through anyway. a map of the Czech Republic. So it says here outdoor map and this one specifically if you like doing outdoor sports which um, I guess is great for the upcoming season and summer. You can see here plenty of routes for uh, people on bikes. There's also Fernlanderwege, so hiking over a longer uh, distance. You can also go kayaking. It's also here for skiing, some info, and via ferratas, which are very popular here in the region. But we want to have a look at the overall country, I think. So the capital's right here, Prague, with, with more than a million inhabitants. I think it's a million and about a quarter of a million. In a country of about 10 million people. Some of the other larger cities are here. Bosnian. There's Brno, Ostrava, Liberec. And a lot of these places I know under their German names. We have Austria right here. You can see here direction to Vienna. And Austria and the Czech Republic have had a very close relation for a very long time. Obviously, the two countries were together on the Austrian side of the Habsburg monarchy. And before that, um, in the Holy Roman Empire under Habsburg rule. So, literally four centuries. And a lot of people from the Czech Republic migrated to Vienna in the 19th century. 
So at the time, Vienna was actually the second largest Czech city after Prague, with probably around 300,000 Czech speakers. So at the time, the data wasn't very reliable because of political situations around minorities. So the official numbers are always much smaller. But the estimation is that it was about 300,000 people. And there's something you still notice today in the surnames that are common in Vienna, which are often of Czech origin. And obviously it's also there in the cuisine, which is very much influenced by Czech cuisine. All right, so we have the border to Austria here. Then here's the border to Germany with the Ore Mountains here. Then we come to Silesia and the border to Poland. Right here. And then here we have the border to Slovakia. If we want to place the Czech Republic in Europe, it would be right here, pretty much in the center. And you can see it's not a country of particularly high mountains compared to, say, the Alps here or the Carpathians. But it does have a certain elevation, and especially the borders are a little more mountainous. With the exception of this border here, this is where you would follow the river Taya, as it's called in German. The highest peak is here on the border to Poland, the Snyszka in the Great Mountains. And what does it say here? 1,602 meters. And then to the north you can see the plains of Eastern Europe. Some of the city names are probably also familiar to you if you are a beer drinker, like obviously Pilsen, which in German is Pilsen, where the name of the beer comes from, Pils. There's also Czeskbudiowice, where the uh, original Budweiser comes from. So now there are two different beers called Budweiser and the one from Czeske Budajowice, so the Czech one is no sold under the name Budweiser anymore, which avoids some confusion. And there's some instructions here on the back. Particularly here for Via Theratus, which is a kind of climbing. It's a mix of climbing and hiking. I have done it once or twice and I thought it was really fun. Here's a view of the or mountains. This is the Elbe, one of the two important rivers in the Czech Republic, which runs to Germany and then towards the North Sea. Some beautiful castles. And there you have some skiing. Okay, let's 
move on to the next lap. And I would say let's have a look specifically at Prague. One detail I've noticed about Prague is that the cover pictures here of the guides are always a little gloomy. Like there's some fog here, you can see. It was taken maybe in autumn or winter. The trees are without leaves. You have all the lights on. And it's the same for this one here, which is a bit older. It's a very kind of gothic, gloomy atmosphere. And I do think that Prague has a bit of a reputation of being a great city to visit, like say October and November, so when the season changes. It just goes well with the, yeah, the feeling in the city. I don't know why that is. It's a beautiful city in summer as well, or probably during any time of the year. So right here we can see that the city is built along a river in German called the Morda and in Czech, the Vltava. I hope I'm saying this somewhat correctly. It's not an easy language for me to pronounce. And the historical parts of the city are on either side. One part lies here. I think you can see immediately these kind of smaller roads. Not really following a specific direction. With a large square here. And of course, we also see that there are plenty of numbers in the area indicating something of interest to tourists. This little design here is the astronomical clock tower at the town hall and then here we have one of the famous churches let's see we have a picture right here Number eight, the Tyne Church, one of the most impressive Gothic buildings of Prague. And I remember the first time I was in Prague, I was really mesmerized by the way that the buildings are set around the church. Usually, if you have such a large church in the center of the city, you have an open square in front of it. But here it's like these cute buildings form a little ring around it. With these nice pastel colors. And then these gothic towers behind it. The 
astronomical clock would be here on the town hall or city hall. Again, you can see these towers. Prague is also called the city of a thousand towers. And I think it's quite obvious why. A very, very famous view is here, this ridge, which we can see here. There are statues all along the wall. The Charles Bridge. It was founded in 1357 by Charles IV, finished in 1402. And on both sides it's fortified with towers. The smaller one from the 12th century and the higher tower is 300 years younger. It's said to be the most beautiful gate of Gothic Europe. And I think rightly so. And if we cross the bridge, Oh, you're walking past another tourist info, so you know this is some beautiful area here. And then let's see, we might walk along here. Hmm, how do we get up there? Maybe here. There's a large square. We can go further here. And we've reached the Prague Castle. You can see that this is a really big complex of buildings, including churches and yards and different buildings. We have a view from the river here, with the cathedral peeking out in the middle. And the castle in Prague also dates back a really long time. The tower settlements in the area uh, quite a long time ago, but the Slavic population probably moved in around 1,500 years ago. And then you had the first uh, Moravian Empire in the early Middle Ages. And Bohemia became a very important part of the Holy Roman Empire towards the end of the Middle Ages. It became a kingdom and the Habsburgs eventually also moved their seat of power from Vienna here to Prague. Particularly Rudolf II uh, was an important figure here. It is said that he was quite interested in alchemy and in um, sort of a mix of science and technology at the time. He had people build really impressive little machines. So like little uh, golden ships, for example, that could move along a table. And maybe there was a figure with eyes and it would move its eyes back and forth. Or they would shoot an arrow. So they were quite entertaining. However, during his reign, 
the situation was not exactly peaceful. You might know Prague from the defenestration, which caused the 30-year war in the Holy Roman Empire, which was absolutely devastating. And that was around the time of Rudolf II. So you had a period of reformation and counter-reformation. And one important figure was Jan Hus. You have a monument right here. Uh, Hus, in fact, has made its way into the German language. It's a bit of a colloquial word, aufhusen, which means to rile people up. So you kind of have an idea of how Jan Hus was perceived in uh, Austria, maybe. We have some more pictures and information here. Beautiful view here, probably in early autumn. The aforementioned church with the many figures on the side. And then the gate into the city. And I like this mix of architecture here. This is the old new synagogue. Right here. With one of these sort of typical buildings of around 1900, which I think you find in most uh, Central European cities. Then over here, some probably 70s, 80s buildings. So there's the cathedral. It was started in 1344, not just to demonstrate the importance of the church, but also as a place to lay to rest the Bohemian rulers and all their treasures. It says here what was not intended was the incredibly long time it took to build it, over 600 years. However, it doesn't mean that they were building it for 600 years, but rather that in the 15th century, the work was interrupted for a couple hundred years and then only finished in the second half of the 19th century. The 19th century was a time of sort of Czech revival the time beforehand is thought of as a kind of dark age when, for example, the Czech language was actively repressed by the Habsburg rulers. And so in the 19th century, not only was the language used again, important buildings like the cathedral were finished. Um, the government also sought for a compromise with the Habsburgs, similar to the Austro-Hungarian Compromise. However, they were not successful. Over oh, here we have a basilica. This one is Romanesque and from the Middle Ages. So it says here it was founded in the year 920. There was a fire in 1142 after which it was somewhat altered. And the 
facade was added a bit later in the 17th century. So the facade is not Romanesque, but rather early Baroque. I particularly like these white towers here. I think they're just absolutely stunning. And not something I've seen very often. It's just really beautiful. And here you see the entry to the castle. And a beautiful park. Here yeah, some information on Written on the first of Habsburg, who extended the area. And then this is quite a famous part of it. This golden Gessian, the golden lane. Quite a cute little street with these small houses and all these different bright colors. It's not golden, but it's named after the goldsmiths who worked here. It was along the wall of the castle, but the fortifications were eventually removed. One of the stories is that the alchemists lived here who are trying to create gold for Rudolf II. But that's just a story. Someone who did live here, one of the most famous people from the Czech Republic probably, was Franz Kafka, the famous author. At number 22. Whereas you also have a, you have an important Jewish history in the city with, for example, the story of the Golem, which is set in Prague. similar to names you would find in Vienna too, which I find uh, kind of fascinating, like Wallenstein Palais, Palais Schwarzenberg. There's probably, if not a Palais Czernin, then at least a Czernin Street somewhere, and the Palais Lobkowitz. This one's a lot more impressive than the one in Vienna, so it looks gorgeous. All right, let's have a little look into the past. So the border between Austria and Czechoslovakia was closed for a long time. It was part of the Iron Curtain. And I think for some people in Austria, it's still a border that's there in their minds. Like one time, for example, I went to visit a bear park there. It's in the Waldviertel, so a very um, idyllic region. Not a lot of people live there. And then as you get to the border, there is a sanctuary for brown bears. So, of course, there's a lot of security. And I told my mom about it, how we were driving through this 
beautiful landscape of meadows and forests and then suddenly there's all of these fences and security cameras and her immediate reaction was oh was that the border and at the time uh, the Czech Republic was already in the EU and part of the Schengen area so it's an open border but I guess when you grow up with this image of a hard border it just I don't know, I guess that's just ingrained in some people. So anyway, this is from the early 90s. And one thing I thought was really funny are the information that you get here at the end on things you have to look out for. So for one, you absolutely cannot drink and drive. In Austria at the time, you could have a beer and still drive your car, but in the uh, in Czechoslovakia, that was absolutely forbidden. So definitely something you had to know as an Austrian. It also says on Mondays, pretty much everything is closed. Museums, castles, lots of stores and services. So as a tourist, don't plan too much on a Monday. If you went by car, you also had to get some petrol vouchers at the border or you couldn't go to a petrol station. Um, or at least it was very expensive to fill your tank. And this one, I would be offended, frankly, if I said this about my country. It says, taste is subjective, but this isn't. Czech chocolate is not an exciting thing. It says it tastes a bit boring. I hope there were some uh, complaints about this. Mm. And here too, it says that um, a lot of people still use coal to heat and so you shouldn't wear a white dress or white trousers in Prague. You should only come with a white vest. And in terms of cigarettes, you should bring your own cigarettes or not smoke if you're in Prague because the uh, you might not be able to get Western cigarettes there and the ones you do get aren't that thrilling. I'm sure that isn't the case anymore. Uh, you wouldn't find uh, information like that. I just want to show you this beautiful guide. This is from the 50s and you can see that the cover is a little worn. It was probably in a shelf, there's a little difference in color. It's a bit lighter here. Then the book itself is in perfect condition. Look at that, isn't that gorgeous? It's hard cover too, which is quite unusual for a tourist guy. It says here, it's from 1959. We have Czechoslovakia. Border in the Soviet Union. 
And there are some oddities like Stalinogrod, which is Katowice in Poland. And there's a Karl Marx Stadt in Germany. It's 300 pages and just 10 maps in black and white and two in color. So this is really quite a wall of text if you compare it to the newer ones. Here's a map of the castle. Look how small the text is as well. There's one of the cathedrals. And then this is a plan of the Charles Church. So all the different statues, one to fifteen on one side and sixteen to thirty on the other. With the information here on the different saints. So Pieta, some Madonnas, John the Baptist. Plenty of historic information. Some on Yosef of Josefstadt, the old Jewish city. And here's some tours for a half a day. goes on through the rest of the country, including here, for example, Bratislava, with a map of the city. There's also a bright red page marker. And Two beautiful maps here. At the end. With some really nice paper. And information in French, German and English. start but a bit larger and I like how it has all the railways on there as well If you compare a book like this to 
a newer one like this, the change is really quite striking. Like right here, half the page is always a photo in color. It's all very bright and easy to use. Whereas I think with this one, you really had to sit down and take your time to read through it. Which, you know, it's not a judgment, just an observation that these books change with our use of them. So let's close this back. This was an, a relaxing little exploration of some travel guides of this beautiful city. And you can drift off to sleep now. I'll see you again next week. Until then, good night.